Welcome to We Can Be. I'm your host, Chris Ducardi. Our guest today uses food as a foundation to change lives and strengthen communities, and the organization she leads has the receipts to prove it. Jennifer Flanagan is the founder and executive director of Pittsburgh Community Kitchen, which offers culinary arts training programs and life skill coaching for those who find themselves struggling at the margins of society. With a 93% placement rate in professional kitchens for those who complete their training programs, Pittsburgh Community Kitchen has also had a focus on regional hunger relief baked into their mission. Let's dig into her journey and the success stories of some of those she and her team have guided to new paths in life. My name is Taurus Reed, and I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I grew up in the Hill District. I had gotten into a little bit of trouble in my life, incarcerated, and it was time for a change. I got presented with Community Kitchens. I was in Mercer Prison, just came home August 2nd, and I heard about Community Kitchen through justice-related services. I got to go to school for $8,000 for free. That's not opportunities you get every day, so I definitely wanted to put my best foot forward. I like to tell my students and these guys who join our program when they come in, their past doesn't define them that there is hope and that they can move forward in life and become successful. I still refer people to this program. This program saved my life. I'm excited to talk with you today because your work is at the intersection of two of the most persistent and high profile issues that we're looking at in our country. One is around food insecurity and access to healthy food. And the other one is about the opportunity for so many people to overcome a set of barriers so they can fully participate in the workforce. Community Kitchen has put both of those together. Can you just describe what it is you do? What's your mission? We are considered an employment-based social enterprise, and that means that we run food service businesses so that we can train people and employ people, transitional employment, apprenticeships, training, all of that. And we integrate that into food services. And a big part of our food services that we do, as you mentioned, is hunger relief. We call it our community meals program. That translates to about 40,000 meals a month that go out to the after school programs that are for kids that are eligible for free and reduced lunches and shelters, other nonprofits. We have some cool programs that we do. We've got one called Hello Baby. It's in partnership with the county. So new moms that have been identified as at risk, we send them six weeks worth of family dinners, which is very cool. We're about to launch something for homebound seniors with diabetes, so we're going to be doing medically tailored meals, basically meals on wheels, but medically tailored. So all of this food service is completely integrated in our training and our transitional employment programs. For us, you can't separate joblessness and hunger. As you mentioned, they go hand in hand. So talk a little bit about the need in this region around food insecurity. What kinds of numbers are we talking about? What percentages of folks? It is growing, and I don't want to misquote the number, but I was just at an event at the food bank, and they said that this year is on par with the height of COVID in terms of food insecurity. It has really grown. Part of the reason why is that food cost has gone up so much. Pennsylvania, I think we're in the top 10 of the states in terms of food cost going up. Philadelphia is actually the highest in the country, and Pittsburgh is not far behind. And so that's a big issue just in terms of people that were not food insecure before. They don't have enough money. If you go to any of those distribution lines that the food bank holds, the lines are long. So it's astonishing to think we're at a point that is at the height of COVID when we had supply chain issues and all of that that was going on. Truly, You know, somewhere around 20 plus percent of folks in this region are food insecure in Allegheny County. That's like 60 plus thousand people. It's a lot of people. If cost is a big piece of it, what are the other pieces that are behind it? It's, It's always the balancing of your needs. So I just was talking to a woman in our program today. She's got some legal issues coming up and she's in our transitional employment program and she's now making too much money to qualify for a public defender and she also lost $400 a month in food stamps. That benefits clip that happens um, when people start to actually move up in their wages, it's the balancing of needs, right? So if you have, honestly, there's a lot of people who put their pets ahead of them in terms of buying food, right? Obviously medication, if you have kids, there's just a lot of things that go along with having kids, the expense of having kids. 
phones, that's not a luxury. Having a phone is not a luxury. Everybody needs a phone. Everybody needs internet. All of those things are competing interests. So let's talk about the other piece of it for a second as background, which is the workforce piece. And you just highlighted something, which is that as people start building skills or Mm -hmm. start being able to participate fully in the workforce, that there's a set of benefits that get stripped away while they still might need them. But talk a little bit more about the need for workforce for training, what you are filling in that ecosystem. So we serve folks that are overcoming barriers and adversity. This could look like spending time in prison. This could look like not having a high school diploma, coming out of addiction, coming out of homelessness, living in poverty. That is a barrier. There's just so many things you have to overcome to get it together to go get a job, right? From transportation to just training, all of the things, right? All of the things we like to say. (laughs) So a lot of our folks have multiple of these barriers. The folks that we serve are incredible people and they really just need a door open. And that is what we do. We open the doors and we just navigate the system for people. If you have fines and fees that you owe on getting your driver's license back, just figuring out how to navigate that system can be intimidating. You know, folks come to us, sometimes they're in a lower wage job and they can't get out of it because they can't quit that job to get a new job and they don't really know where to go for training and they can't really afford training. And so we actually recruit from places that we know do not pay well and get people to come in to upskill and get a better job. So we see all kinds of people. You know, if you've been in prison for 15 years, maybe you don't have a lot of connections anymore. Again, you need that door open. You need an employer reference. You need to brush up on your skills. We get the range of people, too. Some people come to us with a lot of culinary skills, and some people come to us with nothing at all. This industry is amazing. I will go on and on about how amazing this industry is because it can absorb everyone. And it's an industry that you just need to be reliable and interested in learning, and you will move up. All right, so do go on and on because you focus workforce development on culinary Mm -hmm. skills and on this industry. So why this industry? This is an incredible industry for the folks that we serve. It's really an incredible industry for everyone. It's a big family. There is a place for everyone. There is a job on every bus line. There is a job for every shift. There is a job for every background. If you have a drug and alcohol background, we may not put you into a restaurant with a bar, but we might find an institutional employer like a, you know, one of the ones that serve the different corporate dining places or the schools or the hospitals, right? All of those kind of institutional places. If you want to have a career, we can put you on a career path job. If you just need a job as a stepping stone, we can find that for you. It absorbs everyone. And it's such a forgiving industry because so many people in this industry have their own varied backgrounds. So they are really open to giving people chances. I love it. And, you know, we just had a chef stop by yesterday because he heard about our mission and he had his own, you know, background and and varied path to get to where he was. And he said he wanted to come in and talk to our students. This happens all the time. The other thing that we're seeing more of this year are refugees. Mm -hmm. And this is the first year we've really seen an influx of refugees. This industry absorbs that population as well. And so we've been able to get folks jobs that don't speak English. They have their work papers. They don't have any contacts here. And we are able to get them a job really fast. So you talked about one of the key things you you said is such a forgiving industry or a welcoming industry that people from different backgrounds, different skill sets, there's a spot uh, Mm -hmm. in this industry depending on unique needs. One of the things that we hear again and again, this is at Pittsburgh in the regional level, it's the national level right now, which is essentially a mismatch between the jobs and the skill sets or the people for those jobs in this mix. And one of the things you see again and again is in a lot of industries not having that flexibility, not being welcoming for folks in that background. I'm interested if you've thought about translating the lessons you've learned into other industries or if you encourage folks in other industries to to be more welcoming. That would be an interesting sea change for a lot of industries. Culinary and hospitality gets a bad rap, right? Everyone likes to say they're terrible jobs, it's low-wage work. We don't work with those employers, right? We work with the employers that are paying good wages and paying benefits and treating our people well. The industry has always been accepting of the uh, misfit toys, as we like to call ourselves, right? Mm. (laughs) But also, after COVID, there was such a need for employees because uh, everything shut down and there wasn't an option to be choosy Right. And there never really is in food service. It's a more welcoming environment, but it's also a 24-7 industry. So there's a lot of need for people. 
the closest we've come in terms of translating it is when you work with institutional employers and you can tell the difference between the ones who have decided to make a real effort into expanding their hiring practices and the ones that have not. And the ones that have made that real effort, they will review your resume person by person and not make blanket statements um, about criminal background. A lot of employers have done what is called ban the box, which is that check mark on the application that says you have criminal background. But the way that a lot of employers now screen for that is whether or not you have a driver's license. And so it's an informal way of screening if somebody has a background. Mm. It's not always accurate, but a lot of employers do it. So the employers that do the best job of really expanding their hiring is that they're looking at the individual and they're really giving people a chance and they have HR people who are willing to have the interview, have the working interview. You know, we just had a guy who, he did not have a criminal background. He's an older gentleman, veteran. He had some health issues and had just started cycling in and out of homelessness. He couldn't keep his apartment because he couldn't keep his job because of his health issues. And he aged hard, so he looked even older than he was. And he could not get a job. He could not get a break. We called one of our really great institutional employer partners and said, give him a working interview because he'll blow you away. Mm-hmm. And he's now working there. He loves it. That That's another feature of this industry is that the notion of the working interview, you can go in and prove yourself. And if you have hustle and you are in that kitchen and you know how to move about the cabin, then you are get hired. They'll, in your they'll program, be a- how do you balance this need to do, impart technical skills and the ability to navigate through kitchens and all that piece? Plus, you've got somebody who has a unique set of personal circumstances that might be even preventing them from completing the program. Absolutely. This happens all the time. So we do have a program team, and they are tasked with helping that individual identify their barriers and what they need to get help with, and then we try to help them navigate it. And we try our best to use what is, you know, we don't want to be redundant. So if there's another program that can help with something, we're going to tap that program. But we just paid first month in security deposit on a woman who was in a bad living situation. It didn't feel safe to her or to us. And so we quickly got her into another apartment and just paid her first month in security to get her moved. So we do that too. We try to do the things that are going to help you keep employment, your state ID and your living situation, because you can't get a job without ID. And you're not going to keep a job if you don't have a safe place to live. There's a lot of other things around that that we try to knock off and just stabilize people, make sure their childcare is solid, make sure that they, if they have legal situations going on, that we help them with that. Um, And we continue with people after placement. So we formally follow you for a year and just help with whatever is going on and then just make sure that you're tracking correctly. So if we think you should have gotten a raise, we're going to try to help you navigate that with your employer. If it doesn't seem like you're going to get one, we might help you get a different job. Um, We just want to keep tracking you on that pathway to keep making more money. And if you need additional upskilling, you can come back and do that. People's problems didn't start in three months, and we're not going to solve them in three months. And that's the length of our kind of flagship program is three months. So we've been doing more with longer-term programming. There's not funding for it, but we are trying to fund that through our enterprises. So transitional employment is a minimum of six months. And so we have you for longer. You know, if you have a lot of court dates, let's say, but you're an awesome employee, you may not be able to hold a job because you're going to keep missing work, Mm -hmm. right? And so we're going to keep you on our payroll for a while until, you know, you sort of get through all your things and then we'll put you out. And, you know, we can also identify, we had a guy, he was about to get custody of his kids and he had never had them. And we just felt like that was going to be such a change for him that we didn't place him out. We kept him in our employment program just because we felt like he's going to need a little bit more support. So that program is really designed for people who need a, a little bit of a longer period of time in a supportive employment environment. We are really trying to move toward longer term programming for those who need it. That core program, that core 12 weeks, just describe what happens. Somebody comes in, in a cohort with who, does what, and mm-hmm. as you describe that on the skill sets, talk a little bit more about your special sauce, why you think yeah. what you're doing is important. So we bring people in every four weeks, and we do that so that we always have a layered cohorts. Because we are doing, you know, around 2,000 meals every day, and those folks are an integral part of the kitchen, we don't want to turn everybody over at the same time. You get different color shirts as you move through the program. The newbies have green shirts. The first week, they are not in the kitchen. They get their food handlers certification, as we like to say, make sure you don't kill people. 
And <laughs> no, no E. coli spread all <laughs> right. over the place. Learn how to wash your hands, right. save temperatures. We give them kitchen math that week in partnership with Literacy Pittsburgh. And then... I think I'd fail. It's like two pints and a quart, two right. quarts no, and a half gallon, all that. All right. that. Yeah, if, okay. if, you know, the, if the serving size is three ounces and the box is six ounce portions and you need 50, how many cases are you pulling off the shelf? That kind of math, yeah. right? And then just intro to the kitchen, how to turn on the equipment, all of that stuff. So that's really week one is, is just a fire hose of information about how to move safely about the kitchen and also kitchen language, right? Behind, heard, all of those sharp, hot, those sorts of just safety language that you're going to hear in any kitchen. So they get a whole lot of that, and then they get put right into the kitchen. So tier one, our green shirts tend to be cold prep, cold side, so they're learning their knife skills. So they do lots and lots of knife skill, you know, chopping of vegetables. That training also allows us to put more fresh food into institutional meals like shelter meals that may not typically have it. Tier two is more high volume. You're learning all your cooking techniques, you know, roasting, broiling, all of that kind of stuff and learning high volume. And then tier three is when you move into catering events, learn how to plate, different kind of cooking, different kind of presentation. Those folks tend to go out with our catering manager to do setups to see how that looks on that end. And they're in their black shirts because when you're a tier three, you get to wear black. And tier two is purple. So. Got it. <laughs> yeah. All right. And then simultaneous with that, we're doing job readiness. We use a curriculum that was provided by the National Restaurant Association on job readiness. So it's customer service. And then um, we do nutrition classes. And that's a lot of focus on it's nutrition, but it's also special diets right? so they understand what gluten-free is what vegan is and then they're also doing one-on-one um, meetings with our career services team so that they are working on their resumes they're starting to do job interviews you know we do mock interviews we prepare them for that the focus really in tier three is making sure you have a job by the time you graduate so you've got a program that has this thread of skill set development mm-hmm. you've got a whole bunch of stuff about being ready to translate that into the workplace well, yeah, we talk and about the jobs constantly pieces right. of work mm-hmm. and all of that and then a little bit before you're telling stories of a couple individuals that in that mix they have things going on in their lives how does how do you pick that up along in those right. 12 weeks and how do you support folks so we that do piece? formally we have what we call a two-on-one so it's a kitchen it's one of our chef instructors and it's one of our program case manager people And they meet with every individual. And it's a two-on-one because, both because people parent shop, right? They might tell the program team one thing and the chef another thing. But the flip side of that is that sometimes they trust the chef more or they trust the program team more. And so that there's just information and we want to make sure that we understand what's going on in your life. And so those check-ins are really important because we will visit back your identified barriers and make sure that you're progressing on did you do these things did you pick up that referral that we made how is that going anything else that's coming up oh you know what turns out I can't live where I'm living I'm going to be on the street in a week I mean a lot of these things happen quickly and so we have those touch points constantly to identify any new barriers and then how how are we doing helping you address the barriers that you had and so it's just kind of a constant play between program and culinary the entire way through the program. And when folks complete the program you actually have the receipts to back up the success on this. Talk a little bit about your success measures how do you measure yeah, success and relative to what we're pretty proud of it i mean we you know our, our placement rate is right now it's at 93 percent, which is really great especially in consideration of who we serve right everyone says these are really hard to serve people and hard to employ people and um, we have a really great placement rate and then our retention rate on job retention is at 84 percent, which is also amazing for this industry it's got you know high turnover and all that and since January, our placement's been almost 100%. We like to say if you want a job, you will get a job by the time you're done with this program and usually before you're finished. People that aren't getting jobs are the ones who have decided they don't want to work for a variety of reasons. So we're really proud of that. And we have a really great reputation and relationship with employers. You know, we want to know our employers. We want to hold up the ones that are doing well by their employees that really are committed to making a great place to work. We want to be a part of that. We want to be a part of helping be that pipeline for the really good employers. What you describe and the impact you've had and the personalization with the individuals just makes a world of sense. 
how did you get here? How did you get to Pittsburgh? How did you get to Community Kitchen? Yeah, so I was a marketing director at a publishing house in New York City, and 9-11 happened, and I was in New York for that. And my authors that I happened to manage were all finance authors, and so we did uh, lose a lot of authors in the towers. Oh, and, my gosh, I'm sorry. And just living in New York at that time, it was so overwhelming. You know, that whole day, you know, the towers went down, all the subways shut down, the bridges shut down. So there were all these people stuck on the island and all the bars opened and people just would wander in from lower Manhattan covered with ash and everybody would make way for them and get them something to drink and something to eat. And it was like, this is, you know, again, this is the industry, right? Like we take care of people. So I decided to quit my job after that and join AmeriCorps Vista because I wanted to move into nonprofits and I never had worked in nonprofits. And so Vista is kind of like the domestic Peace Corps. And so I got placed in Pittsburgh. I have family back here. And my VISTA assignment was working with the EPA. Doing what? You know, we did some really great playgrounds and community training to train people in different neighborhoods in the city to advocate for themselves. And so, like, training them how to go talk to their councilmen, how to advocate for things. And and then we recovered a few places that were just kind of, you know, drug lots, and we turned them into playgrounds um, with Kaboom, which is a company that does that. Yeah. And so, but during that time, I heard about this uh, model. I was going to social enterprise alliance meetings, and um, I met a founder of the national network that I'm now on the board of, Catalyst Kitchens. And I wanted the model in Pittsburgh. I just thought it made so much sense because, on the one hand, you have terrible food in a lot of institutional places. You know, if you can't choose what you eat, a lot of times you don't get the best food. And so, putting a program in place to increase the quality of that food and 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 marrying that with you know people who need good jobs. So. I launched it as a program underneath another nonprofit, and it was very successful. And then that nonprofit got acquired, and they closed the program. And I thought I was done. And so I was kind of trying to figure out my next steps. And then the funders actually said, you know, we don't think that was quite done yet. You should think about launching it as a separate C3. So in 2013, I relaunched it as a separate 501C3. And, and, you know, when we first started it, it was very much about getting somebody that first job. And we've really evolved into working with people on career pathways and getting them certifications and what can we layer onto this. And on a personal level, you know, I grew up with a mother who was an addict and I was able to kind of survive that and emerge because I had a really strong, you know, my grandparents just the the family network was very strong and your I, village yeah absolutely and i recognize that a lot of people don't have that and so we try to be that family for people that may not have that it's really important to me right yeah you know and and then just recognizing that your past informs but does not dictate your future my mother is she's great she's been clean since i've been I don't know. I think she it was around 23 when she got clean. Um, she's been clean and sober ever since. My brother, my brother went through a heroin addiction, and he's now clean. So like, I, I know what it looks like. I know right. what it looks like to have it in your family. I know what it looks like to watch someone struggle through that. I know all of the dysfunction and the abuse that can happen around living with an addictive parent, the domestic violence stuff, the fleeing your house in the middle of the night, you know, all of that. And I can talk lightly about it now because I've been through it, right? Mm -hmm. I've gotten through the other side. But I want to make sure that we provide those opportunities for other people to just have a safe space. Yeah. And I'm really proud of being a safe space for people. Well, it's the building block for the type of trust you need to earn mm -hmm. and give both ways to have this work. Um, Definitely. Thanks for sharing your story. It completely resonates with what you've built and what you Absolutely. want to make happen. It's, it's very much part of my DNA. You've mentioned a couple times the career pathways, um, staying with folks for a year. What, what does that look like? And how many folks stay in the food service culinary industry and do folks ever you know pathways to other they do. industries what does that look like you know i think because we always tell people on day one we say this can be a stepping stone for you you know you're not sure what you want to do but you need a job you need to get back into the workforce great use it as a stepping stone there's a lot of people uh most people used food service at one point in their life whether that was during college or during high school or whatever right it can be a stepping stone or it can be a career pathway and so if you tell us that you think it wants to be a career pathway we're going to put you 
on a different path, right? So let's say you really want to work in high-end restaurants. We're going to shape it so that your resume reflects that. And we're going to try to put you with a chef who's going to really work with you and, and move you up. If you want to own your own business, and let's say you want to own a food truck, so we're going to probably try to put you on with a food truck operator so that you can see what that looks like. If you just need a job, we're going to get you a job. It's going to pay decent. It's going to treat you well. And then we're going to check in to see, well, what else, what do you want to do? You know, we do have articulation with CCAC. So if folks want to go on to CCAC, they get a semester's worth of credits toward culinary. We've had people go back for accounting, right? I mean, just they just used it as that ability to get back into the workforce or get into the workforce. So some of our folks have never actually held a legal job. So it can be a pathway on a lot of different levels. Yeah, and you never know. I want to segue and talk about scale and about systems change. And to do that, what we do is offering a guest questioner. Hey, Jen, it's Rob Stephanie, Senior Program Director in Community and Economic Development here at the Heinz Endowments. So appreciative of you and your ability to, to get folks into the workforce in meaningful ways and how compassionate you are with folks who are dealing with trauma and a whole host of other issues. Just really an exemplary CV. You know that the Department of Labor last year named Pittsburgh as one of five regions across the country as a workforce development hub, which puts us in a really strategic position. Their involvement gives us a chance to think about really some strategic policy moves that might have impactful effects with the folks that you care about, the folks that you work with. Is there a policy or two that if you could wave your magic wand that you would want to advance? Yeah, so one thing I would do, and this is complicated, there's a few things I would do. From a policy perspective, I really think we need to advocate to our DOL, our state DOL, to make food and hospitality a priority occupation because that frees up funding for this industry. There are so many good jobs and so many opportunities for the folks that we serve because, you know, I get that we are known for tech and, and you know, it's, it's eds and meds and tech, and that's awesome. But for the folks that we serve, they are not walking into one of those jobs. They're just not. They need at least a stepping stone. For instance, a refugee, and I'm a big fan of opening our doors and diversifying our community. Those folks have a very time-limited period to get a job, right? They have to get a job very, very quickly. This is the industry that can absorb that. So if we want to welcome these people into our community, this is the industry that they can get into very quickly. If somebody is court mandated to get a job, we had a we had a young man who was court mandated in four weeks to get a job, um, and he had not held a legal job before. Again, this industry can absorb that. So I think that more investment into the employers that are doing this right, and the same kind of investment that our workforce board puts into other industries they need to start looking at food and hospitality. If I could wave a magic wand, it would become a priority occupation, and that is a designation that allows for more funding to flow into this industry. They can become an asset for our community, but they might need a little bit more time. And so many of the workforce dollars are tied to these, you know, you have to get them a job in six weeks. You have six weeks. That's not enough time. One of the complaints you hear from employers that are working with workforce development agencies is that the people aren't reliable. Well, they're not reliable because maybe they don't have transportation or because they've got kids that don't have childcare or because they've just got stuff they've got to deal with or they're taking care of a family member. There's a million things that people who are more well off, they have people for that, right? And so, of course, they're going to be unreliable because they've got lives that are messy. We all do. It's just that we have people for that. So I think that providing more dollars for transitional employment, that would be huge because it'll bring more people into the system and really turn them into assets for employers in any industry. It makes a world of sense from everything that we've talked about, which is, to a certain degree, what we have is the need to have more integrated support with more time that is more personalized in a system that is actually structured to do none of those three things Correct. for individuals. Correct. And what you're saying is systemically, let's start with what we can do, which is get the right designations in the right ways so we can start moving things in a more productive manner to get this right. built in, this flywheel. It's not the employer's job to support all the other things for an employee, right? Because as an employer, you need people to show up and do their jobs. You have a business, you're trying to make money, great. 
right? But there are entities like Community Kitchen that can do that transitional employment and can absorb those barriers and get those people to a point of stability. I think that has to work in partnership more. I think that too often we think we can put somebody through a six-week program and throw them out to an employer and then say, okay, great, they've got a job. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. There has to be a longer-term investment. You just laid out all of the reasons on the workforce and Mm -hmm. culinary side for the types of investments, which means more time, more thoughtfulness about integrated service services. And you have this combined mission, which is around food insecurity. That actually, I assume, adds another level of complexity to this. It does. So you talked about that combined mission, and at a conceptual and philosophical level, it makes a world of sense. But at that bottom line, enterprise level, how does it work? So, you know, we're training people for food service through food service, which makes a lot of sense. And if we're doing that anyway, we should be making really good meals for the folks that have no voice and no choice in what they eat, right? The folks at a shelter or the, you know, kids in school. So from from that perspective, it just it just makes sense. And a lot of our people have been there. They've mm. been in that shelter we're feeding, or they've been a kid who had to eat the free and reduced lunches or the after school programs. And so it's a real give back for them. It really changes the perspective of who you are when you become not the person asking for services, but the person giving those services. There's a tremendous amount of dignity involved in both, you know, receiving a meal and being invited to the table, which I feel like is what we do every time we serve a good meal to a shelter. You know, we're inviting you to our table, but there's also a tremendous amount of dignity in the hands that create those meals. For me, it's very much integrated in that. We were serving over 2,000 people just in this program, going to different shelters, lunch, dinners, Propel schools. These are people that's dependent on our food. So we took pride in, in getting it out on time and making sure that we repaired it safe and proper. I always wanted to open my own shop, to be honest. So that's going to be one thing I'm working towards. And the reason I want to start my own business is because there's a lot of people out here nowadays that don't have much. And I always said if I ever became rich or ever was able to start something to where I can help the homeless or just give back in general, I wanted to do that. When you have a graduation moment, you know, you're like, you have a job, right? right? Absolutely. And so when you say that, like, if you think about that right now, does somebody jump in your mind a story yeah, that you, you know, would love to share? I, I definitely, I've got a, a lot of them, but I will talk about Samari. Um, he's gone through all of our programs. So he went through our training program and then we made him an apprentice. Samari spent, I believe it was 10 years in federal prison. And while he was in prison, his son was killed and his son and daughter-in-law were killed. He is now, you know, when he came out, he and his wife started raising their grandkids. He's just got a heart of gold and he just opened up his own restaurant down in Fayette County, which we're super excited about. So it's named after his son. And that is a tongue twister for me to say too. Skeets, scoops and smiles. My entire incarceration was during the COVID period. So coming home, being locked up prior to COVID and coming home and seeing so much has changed. So being here gave me an opportunity to actually learn how to cook the right way and to use food to, as a, for therapy for me, dealing with the transition. So for me to go forward, Community Kitchen gave me an opportunity to take something I like to do and to turn it into something that I could possibly earn a living off of, where I could make a career out of cooking, which is doing something that I like to do anyway. A fresh start, to have it realized that I can actually learn something, and not just me, but other individuals can just come here and actually learn something to take it to, take it to the next level. It's such a pleasure to see him succeed. He said to me at the opening, thanks for giving me a chance. And that's what we do, you know. He needed somebody to give him a chance, and we did that. And he has paid us back in spades, just in terms of um, how much he has brought to our program and to our lives. So it's a great success story. And we have so many Samaris, right? We have so many stories of people who came in really down on their luck. One young man, he is from the Congo, and he is a non-immigrant protected status, and he showed up at our program. We, he didn't tell us our story until he was almost ready to graduate, and it turns out uh, his family was trying to have him killed because he's gay, mm. and he ended up making his way here and, and didn't speak any English. He speaks um, French. 
He loved working on our food truck. And so we got him a job with one of our great employer partners. And he's such a delightful guy. And this is somebody who a few short months ago was, you know, his family was trying to have him killed. And he's now here in Pittsburgh and he's got a job and he is now part of our family and he's he's part of this industry. And it's a it's just again, this is what this industry can do, you know, just offering these opportunities for folks. Well, he's also becoming part of Pittsburgh in our region Absolutely. and our chance for us to Absolutely. be able to learn and, from and, him and, and have him be part of us is so I, important. He, he always tells me he's sorry that his, his English is, is so bad and I always tell him it's better than my French. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I'm so glad I asked on that front. So the name of this podcast is We Can Be. And as we close our conversation, if you thought about that phrase, we can be... How would you complete it? We can be a platform for economic mobility for marginalized communities if we do this right. If we focus on the great employers, if we focus the funding, we focus on the correct designations, if we really support this industry, we can be a platform for economic mobility for the folks that we serve. 